Um, let's see. Uh, now I'm just oh, so just some of the general things. Um, who's got the textbook here? Just so I can hold one up. I don't bring mine because I got the giant version. There we go. That's the textbook we use. Show it to the camera. It's a good book. That's why I use it. I wouldn't use a book I didn't think was a good book. Uh, not only do I think it good, it's the book MIT uses. So it's got to be a good book. MIT takes this almost as seriously as we do. They have to. They're charging seven times what we charge. So tell me who's smart and who's not. You guys are sitting here getting the same thing for one-seventh the price of everybody at RPI and at MIT. So exact same stuff. Exact same stuff that we're covering that they covered. Anybody have any trouble getting the book? Okay, comes in a couple different forms. Uh, you'll need at least this volume one for physics one and physics two and three. Um, there is a big version that has, actually, I think volume two is physics two and three. I forget what, because I don't teach those. Um, but if you're going on in the physics, you'll need at least the, the second volume. The third volume, if I remember, is something we don't teach here, so uh, don't bother getting it. But you can get them in the full format. It's also available, as I understand it, in an e-book if you prefer to do that. But that's entirely your business. If you get it used, no trouble, more power to you. If it hasn't come yet, you just ordered it on eBay or something, it's just not here yet, no trouble. Just if it doesn't get here soon, then buddy up with somebody else so you can at least stay on top of the homework. Um, this class, like all of my classes, is run through uh, the Angel course management software that we have here. Has everybody gotten on Angel before or do I need to go over that a bit? Who has not seen Angel yet? Everybody has. Okay, if not, or if you're having trouble with it later, just come see me. Um, when you log into Angel, it won't look exactly like this. This is my version of it as a professor. But all your classes will be listed over there, and one of them is going to be our class here. It's uh, the Engineering Physics, Engineering 105. In there, I have a couple things that we're going to use in some detail. One of the things is resources. I'll use this a lot. First thing you'll want to see is under course documents, the course outline. That's where I kind of lay out some of the rules, how the grading's going to go. There's a whole lot of legal stuff I have to do in there for SUNY to make them happy so the SUNY policemen don't come after me. Um, so some of it's kind of dry. Uh, but also in there, my office hours, my contacts, any of that kind of stuff. If you happen to be somewhere and you just don't have it on hand, you need to send me an email, you can do it that way. But you can also send email through Angel and I'll get it. So that works as well. Um, most important to you, most likely, is the course schedule. It'll look something like that. A couple things you need to pay attention to, of course, is, is uh, all the stuff that there. There's an awful lot in there. Um, I can blow it up a little bit just so we can see. One of the things that used to you is this reading. This book, uh, each of the sections, each, even each of the chapters are fairly short, so it's not a lot of reading. If you skim through this before you come to class, what I talk about is just going to go a lot smoother because you'll already be a little bit familiar with it. So in the morning, first cup of coffee, just sit and, and thumb through that. See some of the terms that are coming up, see some of the diagrams that are already there. Any of that kind of stuff uh, does make what goes in class a little bit smoother because you're just already a little bit more familiar with it. I'm, I'm repeating stuff in a way rather than giving you stuff brand new so it's coming out of sometimes it seems like nowhere. Uh, so th that's the topics, the sections that go with it. These are the homework problems. It seems like there is a lot. We start with a lot. They're pretty simple ones to start with. They're very short ones to start with. And then we start getting a little bit more complicated problems. So you notice that there's fewer and fewer. Don't forget, too, though, that uh, uh, we only have class twice a week. 
you don't have to have these ones done for the next session. But if you leave them all to the end, you've got way too much work to do to get the homework in on time because each homework session section is due at a certain time. So this first one's due in a week. Second one due, then after that, notice there's two days in that and so on like that. The homework is, uh, it's, it's, it's the same thing to you that practice is to an athlete. It's a chance for you to go through some things, uh, make some mistakes when it's still cheap to make them, before you make them in the big game, which are the tests and the like. So do the homework. I collect it, I look through it, I don't grade it in any detail. I'm not looking at your specific solutions in the homework. I'm going to give you the full solutions and so it's your job to sit down and then see what the solutions to the problems are after you've already worked them out. Then I'll grade them almost entirely for format to see how you laid out the problem. Did you communicate to me well that you had a feeling of what you were doing, you were making some effort at it? I'm, I, I look very, very little at the actual specific contact of these things. Which means you can still do them wrong and get full credit for them. So it's worth doing the homework. I'll grade them on a, a 10 point basis. And uh, if you've done all the problems and you've made a real good effort at them, and that means that you wrote in complete sentences, it's legible, your drawings are nice, all those kind of things, I'll give you the full 10 points even if your answer's wrong. If you don't do anything, you get a zero, and then of course there's a whole smear of stuff in between. I will accept homework late. I will accept, you can come into the final exam and hand me homework, and I will accept it and grade it. It's only half price by then, but that's better than a zero. And I'll have put the full solutions up by then anyway, so all you have to do is copy them. And you'll still get at least five points. That's a good deal. That's how important I think these problems are to go through. That I'll even give you five points for doing them by copying them from me. That's a pretty good deal. It's, it's, there shouldn't be any zeros on the homework, that's for sure. We'll also have occasional chapter exams. Uh, it doesn't show up quite there. It shows up a little bit later when we get them. They're on the schedule. Most of them, I think all of them, but no, all three of the chapter exams will be done during lab session. That's what these last three columns are, is what we do in the Tuesday lab. The activity we've got, what we're going to do, what I expect you to turn into me and when, and we'll talk about that in a lot more detail as we go through it. Uh, and then the exams we will do in the lab class itself. Not because it's a three-hour test. It isn't. It's a one-hour test, maybe. But you've got three hours if you need it. And a few of you here will take the three hours. In fact, we'd we'll probably go to four and a half or five if I let you. But I have a life of my own, so I'll give you the boot after a little while. Most of you, though, will be out and gone an uh, hour, hour and a half. Just take the three hours because we've got it and I want you to relax the tests. It's a necessary evil. I mean, there's thousands of research papers on how terrible it is to give tests and nobody's come up with something that's a lot better. At least not in this type of class. Uh, so we'll do them, but I, I would like the pressure to be off of you. They're open book, open notes. I'm not going to check to see what you brought in with you. If you want to bring in three textbooks, no sweat. The only thing you can't bring in is this old trick where you put a piece of paper on the floor and then have a graduate student in physics stand in it and say, that's what I brought in on a sheet of paper. I, I won't fall for that trick. I've seen it. So you can't, you can't, uh, can't email anybody, you can't text anybody, but open book, open notes, I don't care. If you want to photocopy all the homework solutions and bring them in, I don't care. I want you to relax and do your best on these tests. It's my 
best interest if you all got an A. You won't all, because some of you will fight me tooth and nail for your right to get a lower grade, and you'll win. But uh, I, I don't want you. I don't want you to have anxiety for the test. Just do your best. That's all. I want to see see what you're what you're gathering from what we're doing in here. Any questions so far? Oh, one other thing you need to watch on this is up in the upper corner is a date. That's the last date that I modified this. So if that changes, then somewhere on here I modified things for whatever reason. Maybe a snow day or a sick day. Um, sometimes I just decide to change things up as we're going through it. So that date will change. I may know, mention it in class. I might forget. Or maybe so minor that uh, I just don't happen to bring it up. If I do make changes, I will say what they are in yellow, and that's what it says right there. So that if I if I just change a problem number or two, I'll highlight it in yellow. You don't need to print it out again. You can just mark it on your sheet, and, and you're all set. You don't have to make another print. But keep an eye on that. Uh, I'll try to mention it if I make any changes. Sometimes it's going to be obvious I make changes. If we have a snow day, obviously I've got to make changes to that, and I'll make them by, usually by the next class period. So I, I probably won't mention that because that just makes sense. All right. Uh, <clears throat> a little bit, uh, well, I'll talk more about the lab business when we get to it tomorrow, what the tents are there for us to do. So that's the schedule. You can get to it, by golly, right from there, the course schedule. Uh, print that out, keep it with you, refer to it. That's where everything you need to know about the uh, the uh, the uh, details of the class on. Also, here's the homework problem format. Just a little thing I wrote up of explains, gives an example, took a sample problem and said, here's how I would do that problem if I were you, if I wanted all the points available. I also, though, later on, show what you can do to get fewer and fewer and fewer points as we go through until you can get down to the bottom. Here, you'll get one point if you just do that. Just turn in something that's non-blank, and I'll give you a point. <clears throat> also there, uh, it'll be more use to us starting tomorrow, are what I call lab links. There's the first lab we're going to do, so you can read about that when you come in. Uh, I'll have copies available for you tomorrow so you don't have to print them out. All the labs, all the lab uh, uh, instructions and the like I'll always put on there. Um, usually not the day before, but if you ever misplace them or need to look at them again, you'll always have a copy available to you. Useful links. We're going to be using Excel a lot because we're going to take a lot of data that data then needs to be digested, manipulated, reduced. Uh, one of the major things you'd ever do in a lab, and as uh, how many students here are engineering students? And the rest are science, uh, chemistry, physics, undeclared. All right. A lot of you will get into a lab or a field situation at some time. Anyway, it's called data reduction because you're going to take a whole bunch of numbers in the lab, but then when you turn what you turn into your boss is reduced down to maybe just a single number. One of the best ways to do all that is with a spreadsheet like Excel. So we're going to be doing a lot with Excel. Plus, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of graphing of data in this class. It's a terrifically powerful and simple tool to be able to graph something, to visually see what it looks like. It's tremendously important. We'll work on it a lot. I'll drive you nuts, even nutser than usual, over this type of thing. So if you don't know how to use Excel, we're going to learn a lot of that. Let me know if you have no experience with Excel so I can help you right from the start. It's uh, we, we, there's, we, 10, 10 or 12 things of Excel that we really need to know how to do. So that doesn't take long to pick up. 
but you got to let me know if you need help with it. Um, a whole paper I've written on graphing and how to make graphs, they're that important. When I was working for General Electric, I made a graph, my boss gave me something to do, I made a graph, gave it to him. Then about six months later, I went to a meeting with people I'd never met before. The guy was giving a presentation in the meeting on some work they'd done, and up comes my graph. I had no idea they even knew who I was. They probably didn't know who I was. They probably had no idea I was sitting there and they'd never met me. It's just that my work went to my boss, went to his boss, went back down to somebody else in a different component of the company and they needed what I'd done on that graph to put up. When I saw that graph come up on there, I said, thank God I did a good job on that graph so I didn't look stupid. And ever since then, I've taken this graphing business really seriously. Because I don't want you to look stupid. Some of you are going to try your best to do that. And I'll try my best to stop you from doing it. Again, too many times you'll win. But I'll try to stop you from looking stupid. Graphing's a big way to do it. Plus, uh, who in here really loves to write? Just loves writing. Can write. Some of you, some people do. Most of us don't like writing. Picture's worth a thousand words. You do a good picture, you just save yourself a thousand words. That's a good deal. That's a, that's a great exchange rate. So do a good thousand words in a nice picture. Then I have this whole section on writing technical reports um, that will go through lots of links on there, good things I've found over the years that you can use. <coughs> Manning's Ten Commandments. Violate these and don't bother turning anything in. The lab work is about a quarter of your grade. If you want to throw that quarter of the grade away, here's the way to throw it away. Just don't even read that. Just ignore what I put on it. We'll talk about this a lot more as we go through. But start to, start getting ready for this. Uh, I'm hoping in the end that... Uh, uh, one of the things I can get across to you is that um, the, the, uh, the written presentation of the work you do is tremendously important to your success. You can be the best engineer or scientist in the world, but if the stuff never gets off your desk, what good is it to anybody? You cure cancer, but it never leaves your desk or you write it up so poorly nobody even recognizes that you did. So what? What good is it to anybody? So you've got to learn how to write things, present things, to share things in a technical way with somebody else. Part of that, if you want to look at it this way, is I speak a language that you're going to learn how to speak. No different than if you were learning Spanish from me. You need to learn how to communicate with those of us who are already out here. Because it's those of us who are already out here who are going to decide, well, I'm going to decide how many points you get. After this, somebody's going to decide how much money you get. You want to impress those people, don't you? You want more points from me and more money from them. And this is going to help. The better you write, the better someone's going to think of you, the more you're going to be worth to the company, and the more they'll pay you for that. That's a simple reality. It, 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 I'm not making this up. This is an hyperbola. That's the way it is. You're worth it to the company, they'll pay you for it. Uh, also, that will show up here. There's nothing there yet because we don't have... So I'll put the full homework solutions here. That'll come under course resources. I'll have homework solutions. You can click on them by number and they'll come up. It'll be a PDF with all of my solutions. Uh, every exam I'll completely solve for you and put up there the day after the exam, unless somebody still needs to take it, someone who missed class. Um, all that will be available there for you. I try to make as much available to you as I possibly can. Um, just if nothing else so you don't bug me later. It can be a great job if one for the students. I'm trying to get rid of the students, keep them away from me. That's my, my plan. Uh, also, discussion forums. If you have, oh, 
look at my spelling there. Good job. I got a new keyboard. For, I'm not sure all the keys work. Maybe my fingers are getting fatter as, as I age. I don't know. Uh, if you have a question on homework, post it there. Don't do it the morning the homework's due because you may not get an answer in time. But if you're uh, uh, four days ahead, post, an an uh, post a question in there on the homework. I'll post right there any, any uh, corrections or hints. If I find out a particular problem is giving everybody some trouble, I'll post a hint there to let everybody be able to solve it. If somebody posts a question there and you can answer it, answer it. You give a good answer, I'll give you extra credit points. Why not? You've done some work for me. I'll pay you for it. I'm pretty generous with extra credit. Four, five hundred thousand extra credit points at a shot. I've given some students so many extra credit points, they took them and cashed them in for a PhD and they're out of here. That's pretty good. That's a good deal. You get your PhD in a couple weeks here and be gone. Where do you think I got mine? <laughs> Well, I got mine on eBay. Uh, but all that kind of stuff will be available there. Any Anything I think that can help you will be there. I'll put up on here. And if there's something you'd like that's not there, ask me for it. I'll put it up. Also, of interest to you are grades. As we accumulate some scores, I'll put them on Angel so you know what I've got in the book. If you've got a 30 on something, and I accidentally recorded a three, you want that fixed, I think, I presume. <coughs> this is the only way you and I are both gonna know what went into the grade book and if I entered something wrong. By the end of the term, I'm gonna have to put in, I got this class, I got four other classes. By the end of the term, I'm gonna have to put in 400 numbers. I'm gonna make a mistake on at least one of them. I don't want it to be yours. This is the way to check. One thing I warn you about, though, is Angel will calculate a percentage grade for you. I cannot for the life of me figure out how it makes that calculation because it's always wrong. So don't look at the percentage grade. It gives you a total percentage of all the things you're going to do. I think what it does is I go into Angel and I put in the four categories, homework, chapter exams, final exams and lab work, I put in those four categories and if you don't have any scores for the final exam, for example, which you won't until the last day, it gives you a zero for that and then figures it into the calculation. Doesn't make any sense. I think that's what it does. But I don't care to look into it any farther. So ignore the percentage, just make sure the numbers are all right. If something's wrong, bring the paper to me, say, see, you crook, you gave me a 30, you only put down a three. No, say it nicer than that. You're asking me for a favor. It's a good favor. You deserve it, but be nice. All right, so check the grades there as they go in. What else? Um, there will be a final exam. The time is already on the schedule there, the schedule I just had up, so there's no reason to miss that. Uh, we got lab as we go along, chapter exams, homework, that's pretty much everything. Oh, um, cell phone policy. I have a cell phone, very strict cell phone policy for my classes. I understand that you're the wired generation. You couldn't possibly conceive of not being in contact with, with the homies at every minute. So you want to leave your cell phones on. I understand that. And so my policy is you leave your cell phone on if you want to. I have no trouble with that whatsoever because I know you want to be in contact with everybody at every minute. That's what you're used to. That's what, that's what your life has been since, uh, since cell phones came out. When you're in, I don't know, fourth grade or something probably. So leave your cell phone on, no trouble at all. I don't have any trouble. Any other professors say that is their policy? I bet you. I bet you not. I bet you haven't heard that today. However, Here's the deal. You leave your cell phone on, no trouble. If it goes off and distracts me, I answer it. <laughs> no questions asked. If it goes off, you hand it to me and I answer it. If it's your girlfriend, 
She will not be by the end of that call. <laughs> if it's your mom, I will know exactly what you left on your bedroom floor that day. If it's your stockbroker, I'm going to sell everything in your portfolio at the market. And I will probably short the other half. Go look that up and see what it means. You're going to be in trouble. That's the deal. Leave your cell phone on. I have no sweat. No trouble with it. I don't mind at all. But I answer if it goes off. And that includes a text, which is usually some stupid little noise. But I'll know who it is because you'll be the only person in class who's bright red at that moment. So I'll know whose phone has got a text message and I get to answer it. And I've trained in the use of every cell phone there is. So don't think I can't figure out how to send a really good text message with all kinds of explanatory graphical language of some kind. Deal? If you want to sit in class and text and it doesn't bother me, go ahead and do that. If it doesn't bother me, what do I care? So go ahead and you can't, if you, if you want to text them, just don't distract me. If it bings or dings or rings, that distracts me and I get to answer it. But if you're just twilling away under the desk, because I know some of you can, well, we got two women in here, they can text, God, man, women, they can text like crazy. I know that already. I have a daughter. You don't even have to look. Are you one of those? You can text blindfolded under the desk? No? You're not that good yet? You're working on it? Uh, if, if, you, if you can do that, I don't care. Studies have shown if you text a lot in class, you do as well as someone who never comes to class at all. If you text in class a lot, you might as well not even come and save the time. And it's not going to hurt you one bit. That's a pretty good deal, too. If you're a heavy texter, take the day off. It's not going to hurt you. You're still going to fail. Alright, deal on that? Understand the cell phone policy? Okay. Any questions? Concerns? Accusations. Nope, we're okay? Everybody, we're all right? All right, let's go here then. Let's get down to that which we call physics one. Make sure I got everything here. Well, for the most part I did. Um, physics one is often generally called classical mechanics. What we're going to worry about in this first part of physics is the, the simple idea of where things are, when are they there, what are they doing next, how do we make sure they do next what we want them to do, or prevent them from doing next what we don't want them to do. Those, that's the simple type of stuff we're going to look at in this physics one. It has an awful lot to do with the type of things you do every day. None of this is going to be uh, uh, completely out of the realm of your experience. This is all very real to life stuff. Some of it is going to be simplified a little bit. There's things that you're just not ready to study yet in great detail. The, the reality of the way things work is just too complex. The mathematics is too complex. Some of the concepts are too complex. You're just not there yet. Hopefully, you will be. And if you don't need to be, then you won't go that far. And you'll be fine for it. But we're going to start out with some very straightforward things uh, that you're very, very experienced with yourselves as, as regular, everyday people in a physical world. We'll drill down in some more detail in some of it than you would just walking around, but a lot of it has to do with just how, how in the world you get from one place to another during your day. There's things we're going to cover in here that might save your life. I can guarantee we're going to talk about a couple of those things. I know they've saved my life before. I don't know if that's good news to you or bad, but it's certainly good news to you if you save your life. So. We'll cover some more of this stuff in, in some good detail as we go through here. 
All right. Uh, <coughs> physics, like any other physical science, is very, very much a science of measurement. We can't do any of the things we need to do in physics or science or chemistry or engineering if we can't measure some things. And once we measure those things, we need to be able to relate those measurements to people in a way that they understand. So one of the uh, most important things that, that uh, we in the science community have come up, uh, come up with is the, uh, the system of units that we use. We will use, for the most part, the metric system, or what's also known as the SI system. Actually, that's kind of redundant to call it the SI system because that's what the S stands for, System International. It's the metric system. You've all heard of it. You've all been used to it. Um, it's made up of only three fundamental units. One unit is that which we use to measure length. In the metric system, that fundamental unit is the meter. Anybody know how the meter was defined? How do we know what one meter is? Because it's vitally important. If I call something one meter, and I'm working with some people in India, as so much of the engineering is done nowadays, half of the Boeing Corporation is in India. If they don't know what a meter is, that I'm thinking, how are we going to build a plane that's going to fly? We've got to agree on what a meter is. So, at some time or other, it wasn't all that long ago, the meter was defined by the metric system, the, the, some bureaucrats. How did they define a meter? Anybody know? Wasn't that how, uh, how far the speed of light travels? Now, that's what it is now. It's that kind of thing now because it's much more precise. It's, it's, well, when you hear how it was originally defined, you'll realize we needed something else. So now they define it as so many wavelengths of a, of a, a vibrating ang uh, Armenian atom or something. I don't know what. You can look it up if you need to know. But it's that kind of thing. But that's not how it was originally defined. That's how uh, it's defined and, and quantified now so that you know what a meter is and the guys in India also know what a meter is. So we're going to build something to the same size when we're working together. But does anybody know how the meter was originally defined? Because they, this was I don't know, like the 1870s or something. They said, da, this will, actually they said it in French, because the French were there, da, this is how we'll do a meter. Pretty, pretty awesome French accent. Yeah, the girls. <laughs> They're, whoa, anybody speaking a French accent is just amazing, isn't it? British. Huh? British is Br British seems right. Yeah, if you want to have your own TV show, you have to be British nowadays, I notice. So, anyway. Um, so, in the 1870s, 1880s or something, <coughs> a couple of French guys sat down and said, this is a meter. Nobody knows? Well, it had to be... It had to be referenced to something everybody's got, so that there wasn't. Any, you know, I couldn't say uh, a meter is is uh, this length of wood I have in my backyard because nobody in the other countries got that. It's got to be something everybody's got, right? Is it the length of their leg? No, because everybody's got a leg, but not everybody's got the same length leg. I don't know if you knew that or not. You probably thought they're all standard issue. <laughs> What's one thing everybody in the world has? Water. Water. Water, well, yeah, but that's, how do we make, what do we do, icicles? Everybody in the world, we all share one thing. We share the world. So that was the basis, the reference. for the meter. From the equator to the North Pole, 
divided into, and it's going to take me a while to draw all these divisions, divided into 10 million pieces. Give me a minute. Divide that distance from the equator to the North Pole into 10 million, that length of one piece is a meter. That's how it was defined. We're going to double check this in lab tomorrow. You think, I can't measure 10 million things. I'm going to give you a two meter stick, so you only have to do five million. Everybody in the world has the world at their disposal, so one quarter of an arc length around the world divided into 10 million parts was called the meter. So now you can see why that's a good start, because everybody's got the world to refer to, but it's not all that practical. So they redefined it as so many wavelengths of a certain atom in vibration emitting light or something like that. You can look it up. It's all there. Uh, uh, but at least it was a standard reference that we could all agree on. That was a big... In fact, that's part of what inaugurated the Industrial Revolution. Now we could communicate with each other on what we were doing. In the English system, there's the foot. How do you think that unit was first defined? It couldn't possibly be something so stupid as the length of somebody's foot, could it? Wasn't it something king's foot? It's exactly what it was. It was the length of somebody's foot. It was the king's foot. What do you think happened when that king died and a new king came in? What happened to the measuring system? What happened to the whole system of commerce when the basic unit of measurement changed? All right, everybody out in the countryside knows that the king died, but do they know the size of the new king's foot? That's the English system. That's the kind of thing it's based on. It's tremendously colorful and makes a great story, but God, how you do engineering with that kind of thing. It's very, very difficult. Yeah, that foot's standardized now. We, there's, a, there's a Bureau of Weights and Measures that agrees on what a foot is now. But back then it was terrible. And the, the, the hard part too is, the continuing hard part with the English system, is everything, all the subunits of the foot were defined some other way. If, we, if a meter is too long for us, well, we'll just use centimeters or millimeters. But it's no trouble because we know exactly what that definition is. It's just a multiples of 10. But if we don't want to use feet, we've got to go down to inches. How was the inch defined? It was not defined as 1 12th of the king's foot. What they found is they defined an inch here, they defined a foot there, and about 12 of them fit in. So they said, oh, let's just call it 12. But how was the inch originally defined? Because they had an inchworm? No, that's how the inchworm was defined. All inchworms are one inch. The inch was originally, and I'm not making this up. God, I wish I was. I'm not making this up. The inch was three barley corns laid down end to end. That was an inch. Three barley corns. What are the chances that the three barley corns you carry with you every day are the same size as the three barley corns I carry every day? And happened to be the 12 of those were about a foot. So they said, oh, well, look, we got to stop with the king's foot and we got to stop with the barley corns and stuff. So now they tried to define them better. But the trouble still is, if we don't want feet, we got to go down to inches. We got to remember that that's twelve. Then the the inch is that divided into quarters and eighths and sixteen. Everything you could catch it's just a mess, and it gets it doesn't even stop there. It goes farther and farther and farther. But those those two things will be our fundamental units for length. We'll do some stuff in centimeters and millimeters and kilometers if it makes more sense. We'll do some stuff in miles. 
four inches if it makes more sense, but basically that's where we'll start with meters and feet. The next fundamental unit was that unit that measures mass. Mass is, is how much material is there in something, and we figure out what it is by exerting a force on that something, seeing how fast it accelerates, and from that we get the mass. Sounds kind of complicated, but we'll make a little bit more sense of it later. The basic unit in the English system for the mass is the kilogram. Anybody know where that came from? How they first defined the kilogram. Now remember, the whole basis of the metric system is something everybody can use to agree on. Not, not the king's, not the mass of the king's head or, or his 20 of his coins in a burlap sack or whatever, I don't know what. Alan? There you go, water. Everybody's got water. So that's how they did it. They took the length they'd already defined, and they said, let's take one-tenth of a meter. We'll make a cube a tenth of a meter on a side, which is how many centimeters? Is a tenth of a meter? There's a meter. How many centimeters in a meter? 100, centa, is what it means. Centa means 100. So we got a tenth of that, we have 10 centimeters. So, so this is a little cube, 10 centimeters. That's a volume, a volume, that volume, in fact, that's a liter. A liter of water has a mass of one kilogram. That's how it's defined. Pure water, distilled, you know, because you don't want some of the pond water you guys have been drinking out of when you were little kids in your formative years, which explains a whole lot about your personality. So everybody, we figure, can come up with 10 centimeters on an edge of pure water, and now they know what a kilogram is. Uh, actually, in, in, uh, in France, in the, the office that takes care of all this stuff, is a kilogram mass of, uh, I don't know, it's palladium or some extremely rare metal that's extremely stable. Um, in that it doesn't change much with heat and doesn't wear out as people handle it and the like. And it's about seven floors down through bolted doors in this building and you've got to, you've got, if you want to check your kilogram against their kilogram, which everybody in the world has to do every once in a while to make sure we all have the same kilogram, you have to send your kilogram out to them, and they'll weigh it against your kilo, their kilogram uh, uh, reference unit against yours. See if yours they might shave a little bit off of yours, or maybe put some bubble gum on if they need some more. They'll, they'll make it so they balance. Then they'll cash your forty thousand dollar check and send it back to you. But they will not let you come in and touch that thing. You know, it's 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 that vitally important that everybody agrees on these, these units, the, the, the kilograms and the like. It's that important. So uh, uh, a kilogram of water, about that big, give you kind of an idea. You've got an idea about that, so now you know about the mass of a kilogram. The unit of mass for the English system, there isn't a good one. There's two that are in some use. They're both kind of stupid. We're not going to use either one in this class because they're both kind of stupid. And, and it's not my job here to make you stupider. If I can help it. And then the, remember I said there are three fundamental units. After that, everything else is defined from those three. The last is time. And it's the one thing that both the English and the SI system agree on. The second is our basic unit. Though we will use hours 
and we will use days, and we will use years, and the like. Um, <coughs> this one was, it's the only one in the SI system that's kind of, kind of built on, on the story of, of the human existence, like the king's foot was. Um, a day was pretty easy for everybody to define. We know basically how long one day is. Then they divided that into 24. Divided into 24 because that's fairly easy to divide. Remember when they're making instruments, they had to eyeball or, or measure a lot of division. So it was fairly easy to divide something into 12 segments. And then I don't know why they did it in an hour, then into 60. And uh, uh, a minute, 60 of those is a second. I don't know why it's 60. Why not something else? Um, We'll use those basic ones. Every other thing we measure from here on out will be based on these three. And we'll get to them. We'll talk about them uh, as we get through them. Oh, uh, I, I do have, let's see, that the, I have it written down here. If I actually check my notes, I can see. The, the, uh, Meter, one meter is defined as the distance light travels, the distance light travels in one, 299,792, no, no, two, 299,792,458 two of a second. Light goes that far. So uh, all you have to do is uh, have a stopwatch. However, time had to be also defined it's 9,192,631,770 vibrations of a cesium atom. Which, of course, everybody carries in their wallet, so they can check that. All right, everything, all the units from then on will be derived units that we'll get to uh, <coughs> as we talk about them, as they come up. All right, one of the most important things you can do with those, good thing that wasn't your cell phone, I would have answered it. One of the most important things you need to learn to do with these units is pay attention to them. If you give me an answer and you don't tell me what the units are on that answer, you tell me a certain length, but you don't tell me if it's meters or feet, you're not getting credit from me because I don't know if you're right or wrong. If you haven't told me it's seven meters, how am I going to know it's not seven feet? I'm not giving you credit for a, for a swing in the dark. I'll give you credit for a good answer. So every answer you give me has got to have the units with it, or you will not get full credit from me. I guarantee you that right now, and that's not negotiable. You can't come to me and say, I want my points back. Here's what I meant. Here's where it was somewhere else on the page. Not my business to go looking for your answers. It's your business to give them to me. So every answer you've got has got to have the units with it. If you don't think that's important, then imagine when you go get your first big job, you get through the interview process, some big engineering firm makes an offer to you and say, yeah, we're going to pay you 80000 a year. You go, yes, 80000 a year? And buy that, that red car I've had my eye on for so long. That's all guys ever buy with their first paycheck is a red sports car. 80,000, yeah. And you go to pick up your first paycheck and it comes and it's very small. So, it was 80,000 pennies a year. I didn't ask. I should have asked them, was it $80,000 a year or 80,000 pennies a year? I didn't ask. Units matter on these numbers. I even had it. Does any <coughs> see? I've tried this already in class today. It's flopped terribly because because you guys are also culturally naive, which means you don't know things about the world that I know. Uh, anybody know what Prairie Home Companion is? You do. One person. Nobody else knows what Prairie Home. It's a radio show. Very funny radio show that's on every Saturday night. Oh, the trouble is it's on uh, it's on NPR and you guys 
don't know where NPR is, do you? You do, because we're cool. We're, 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 we're sophisticated. But you, you guys, you're just on your cell phone all the time in your red sports car. And a, a, a unit's joke on, on, uh, on her own companion this weekend. And I thought, oh, I wish my students would hear it. That's a very funny unit's joke. Guy went to the doctor. He wasn't feeling good. Doctor, I don't feel so good. Doctor did some tests. Came back to him and said, bad news. I, I, I think you're going to only go be with us about ten more. Ten more? Years? Months? Days? The doctor said, five, four, three, two. It's ten seconds. That was a good, sincere laugh, Mike. Nice job. Units, units matter on these answers. You've got to give me units on your answers. Another thing, though, you can do with the units that will help you is what we call dimensional analysis. That means as you go through a problem, if you look at the units in it, you can tell if you're doing something wrong. If you're doing something wrong, fix it. Don't turn it into me if you know you're doing it wrong. So you can check this with dimensional analysis. One of the easiest uh, way. Well, let's let's start with this. Uh, one thing we're going to be working with a lot is velocity, the speed of something, how fast something is moving. If you're in your car and you look down at the speedometer, bless you, what do you see? Well, if if you're a guy and you're on the north way, you see 85. 85 what? miles per hour. So you you know that that velocity must be in miles per hour. By the way, when I'm talking about just the units, I'll put them in brackets. If I have a number with the units, I don't use any brackets at all, as you'll see as we go. This just means I'm talking about the units only. So I put them in brackets just to make sure. That way I know uh, I didn't write down the units and, and I forgot to put the number down. Uh, this tells me there is no number there. There's not so many miles per hour. This I'm just talking about the miles per hour. But the guys, you're going down the, the north way, 85 miles per hour. Miles measures what? Distance. So I know this must be distance divided by, well, hours is time. By looking at the units, we figured out how to calculate speed. It's the distance traveled divided by the time it took to travel that distance. Well, you knew that anyway. It's 150 miles to New York City. You did it in three hours. What was your speed? 150 miles in three hours. Your speed was? 50 miles per hour. You can, if you forget how to calculate something, figure it out from the units. I actually, I remember in freshman year doing this in a test. I couldn't remember how to figure out something. I couldn't, we were in the enlightened days of open books, open notes, tests. I had to remember, I couldn't remember the equation I needed. I looked at the units and figured out the equation. What it had to be for the units to work out right. So you can use it to come up with things you don't know about yet. Yeah, everybody knows about speed, and but that was just a simple one we could pull off real quick here. The most important way you need to use dimensional analysis is to make sure they match when they have to match. Here's an equation that you may recognize from high school physics if you took it. Uh, it's an equation we're going to run across in a couple weeks here actually a couple days, delta t or delta x equals one half a t squared plus v i t, we'll leave it at that. 
Now, maybe you recognize this, maybe you don't. It doesn't matter. We'll get to it as we go in the details, but what I want to demonstrate is this business of dimensional analysis and how very important and how very easy it is to do. You don't know what the delta symbol is yet. We'll get to that. Uh, but x is a distance. So we might measure x in meters. The delta means change in. So this is change in x, change in, well, if we're, if we're measuring something in meters and it changes, it's still going to be in meters. So we know that this should be in meters. Then there's an equal sign. So, if those things truly are equal, if it's meters on this side, it darn well better be meters on that side, or I don't know how they're going to be equal. I don't know how something in meters can be equal to something not in meters. So, this must be in meters as well. One half, well, that doesn't have any units on it. We'll see where that one half comes from a little bit later. A, what do you think A stands for? Anybody remember from high school physics? Acceleration. acceleration. All right. You might not remember what the units are in acceleration. So fine, leave it at that. Some of you remember what those units are. Some of you don't. What are the units on time, though? Seconds. Oh, but we're squaring it. So this will be seconds squared. That's, that's all that can happen when you square time. Well, the only way meters can equal something times second squared is if that something has units of meters per second squared. That way, the second squares will cancel. We have meters equals meters. And you just figured out what the units are on acceleration. Who remembered that acceleration comes in meters per second squared? I was right, wasn't I? Acceleration has got to be in meters per second squared for this side to equal that side. So if you ever forget what the units are in something, take a second, figure it out. Also, double check. A lot of times you're going to be writing out an equation, oh, maybe you can't remember. Is this squared or isn't it? I can't remember if that should be squared. Well, this tells you it's got to be squared because it wouldn't work out otherwise. That'll help catch those little types of mistakes. So, Two things on either side of the equal sign must have the same units, which you'll only know if you analyze the dimensions. Dimensions and units are kind of interchangeable terms. Um, this side, oh gosh, I, I just can't remember what the units are for V. But I know already the units for T are seconds. So units for V have got to be meters per second. Same thing we figured out there. Well, that was miles per hour. This is meters per second. Still, it's just a velocity. But once again, meters equals meters plus meters. You can't add or subtract things that aren't of the same units. You just can't do it. It's not a rule I make up because I'm an anally retentive engineer. Yeah, I know. That's redundant. It's not a rule. That's just the way of the world. You can't add things together if they're not measured in the same way. And they can't equal each other if they're not measured in the same way. <clears throat> and of course, subtraction and addition are really the same, same basic operation. So you can't subtract things that aren't the same units either. So analyze the dimensions, the units, on your problems and you'll save yourself a ton of points. If you ignore those, you do so at your own peril. Don't come whining to me saying, I only left off my units. It hardly means anything. 
Uh, anybody remember about about five years ago? Well, you probably don't remember anything five years ago. You're only that tall. About five years ago, we were sending up uh, one of those exploratory probes to Mars. And I don't know if you've ever seen the, the, the TV show where they, they're in the command center as these probes are going to land on Mars and all the engineers are crowded, crowded around the, the, the computer monitors and the TV screens because all the work of years and years and years of incredible labor to produce this, this probe that is now millions of miles away and about to land on a different planet. It's all coming down at this one moment. So they're all gathered around. They all have matching t-shirts that their boss bought for them. And there's, you can see in the background, there's cake and there's punch and everybody's all excited. And they're all looking at these monitors as this probe is about to land on Mars. And the first signals will start coming back from Mars, and they're all nervous, and and you know there's a little blackout period while it goes through the atmosphere, and all kinds of things. Excited, very dramatic. Um, well, probably isn't to the general public, but but we like that kind of stuff. And so they're all crowded, and they're looking at the monitors, and they go into the blackout period, which means that the probe has just entered the Martian atmosphere. There's not a lot of atmosphere there, but there's some. And so there's that incredible heating up that happens and it cuts off communications. And then a couple seconds later, it's supposed to come back out of that and they get the signal and then they know just where they are and seconds later it actually lands on the planet. And then the, the, you know, the, the, the solar arrays pop out and the antennas go up and, and the guy driving the thing wakes up and, and all the signals start coming. <coughs> The, the probe went into the atmosphere, the signal disappeared. Signals do back in, I don't know what, 12 seconds? But 15 seconds goes by, then 20 seconds goes by, two minutes goes by. Can you imagine the sick feeling of, of those people that just put their heart and soul into this project for five years? Can you imagine the feeling of the principal investigator, the person who got the millions of dollars to pay for this. It was his idea. And it's gone. And they never, ever, ever got a signal from that Martian probe. They have no idea to this day where it is. It disappeared completely. But they figured out what went, they figured out why they lost it. They just don't know where it went. And they can't go get it back. They figured out why they lost it. It happened because, uh, and, and you'll find out, most of you when you go to work in an engineering firm, uh, especially a big project, uh, a big project, nobody works on an entire object. Everybody works on little parts of a thing. And then they communicate with each other to make those things all work together. One group was working on one part of this Martian probe and some of their information related to how somebody else's part was working on this Martian probe, but they didn't use the same units on their measurements. The, some of the numbers this group was using was centimeters, some this group was using millimeters or something, I don't know what the details were, but they didn't communicate the units with each other. So the things didn't work together like they were supposed to. They didn't check their units. Something as simple as this. And that Martian probe and all of those man hours and all those millions if not billions of dollars is gone. So I bet you were several engineering careers. So it's terribly important at times. Now we're not going to kill anybody in here, I hope. We might get to that. But we'll stop before we go too far. But learn how to do this now so that later when your career is in jeopardy with every single thing you do, as it will be, because if you were an employer, that's how you'd treat your employees. You wouldn't say it to their face, but that's the deal. You screw something up in the company, you could lose your job. And it can happen like that, I hear. 
positive that happens like that. So let's learn how to do it now. So when your your career is in jeopardy, at least it won't be in jeopardy with that. Because that's such a simple thing to do. Check the units. Hey, put that thing at 10,000. Okay, 10,000 it is. And then only later you ask, was it millimeters or centimeters? Uh, about, uh, about 20 years ago, an airliner was flying into Canada. It was flying across Canada. They, had, uh, uh, they were only about halfway across Canada. They looked down and they're out of fuel. Luckily, the pilot was kind of like that guy who landed in the huts and he knew what he was doing behind a plane that's not working right and he was able to land the plane <coughs> on, uh, because it ran out of fuel halfway through the flight. And if you think, well, why didn't they fill up the tanks when they left so they had enough gas, to, enough fuel to get all the way across Canada? Well, they thought they did. The way they fuel up planes is uh, it's, it's something like they weigh it, and then they pour in some fuel, and they weigh it again. It's something like actually they, they don't weigh the plane; they weigh the, the tanker that's doing it. They do it by by how much weight of fuel is going over, and they had the wrong units because one person thought it was pounds, the other person thought it was kilograms or something like that. So they only put in half the fuel that they needed. And the, luckily the plane didn't crash because the pilot was able to land it. But it was because the, the fuelers, the foolish fuelers, didn't check the units on the measurement. They didn't put in enough fuel. So don't do that either. Be careful with this. Did I get that point across at all? I say that because I don't know how many of you will turn stuff into me without the units or with wrong units or units you just ignored. You know, you, you know, I know I'm supposed to have second squared here, but I don't have it. Well, I'll just throw in the squared. I'll just put it on. Your, your, your career's in jeopardy. Because you've got to get through this class if you want to be an engineer or, or go on to the other things you might want to do if it's not engineering. So, uh, one thing we're going to have to do is, is occasionally we have numbers that are in certain units and they're not the right ones. We, we have a measurement in feet, but maybe we need that measurement to be in meters. And we have to know how to convert it then. So, it's a vitally important skill to learn how to convert units. We can convert similar units to other similar units. We can convert length units to other length units. We can't convert length units to Mass units, that's not a conversion, that's a calculation. You're doing something entirely different. This is about converting units, measuring one thing, into measure its units measuring the same thing, just with a different scale. Same thing you do is if you put down a meter stick, went over and got a ruler and put it down a, a what is it called, a foot stick? An inch stick. A ruler. A ruler. So we got to learn how to convert units. Uh, a, a couple things make this very, very easy. One of the things is that what happens when you multiply a number by one? What happens to it? Pull your calculator out and check if you're not sure. When you multiply by one, you don't change the number. That's really important to us because we don't want to change this unit. <clears throat> we don't want to change the, the quality of what we're talking about, just the way we're talking about it. So we can multiply by one all day long and we're not going to screw anything up. 
That's the first thing you need to remember about multiplying, uh, converting units. The second thing you have to remember is, well, what one do I multiply by? There's lots of ones out there. I, I don't know, maybe that doesn't seem like it makes sense because you can probably only think of one one. If, if A equals A, then what's A over A equal? One. one. Now, I didn't even tell you what A is. I don't need to, do I? You know that that's equal to one. So there is the one you're going to multiply by, right there. Does that make it clear? I wouldn't think so. Because you still don't know what A is. All right, here's the deal. Let's, let's do something real simple. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's say we have a measurement that's 6.7 feet. And I'm going to do it in the English system just because everybody's so used to this that it won't be any struggle. Most of you have used the metric system some, but you're just not all that comfortable. I myself, for all the years I've been in science and engineering, I still don't think in the metric system. You want to ask me how far it is from my house? I'll tell you in miles. You ask me what temperature it is? Well, I can't count that low. But tomorrow when it's warmer, you want to ask me what the temperature is? I'll think in degrees Fahrenheit, not Celsius. I just don't think that way. Neither do you. We're Americans. We can't handle that kind of stuff. Like, like the old lady said, I can't start measuring gasoline in liters because I can't afford to get a new gas tank in the car. I, I have to measure in gallons. That's what my car holds. In old liters. Poor old lady. You just imagine her on the rocking, on her porch in a rocking chair with a 22 on her lap, shooting the kids as they go on her lawn. Poor thing. All right, so we want to convert. 6.7 feet <coughs> into however many inches. That's, a, that's what I talk about when I talk about a unit conversion, converting units. We've got something in feet, we want it in inches instead. Now most of you know uh, there's 12 inches in a foot, but maybe some of you are thinking, uh, do I divide by 12 or do I, I just can't remember. You don't need to remember. We'll let the units tell us what we do. When we divide, when we multiply, the units will tell us perfectly how to do it. What we have to do is figure out, we've got that, we want to multiply it by one, but we have to figure out what the one is we want to multiply it by. So we need something that says A equals A that relates feet to inches. That thing is one foot equals 12 inches. There's our A equals A. There's our A equals A. Now what I have to do is, well, I don't multiply by it with this because that's not one. I want to multiply by one. So I want to put one of these over the other. The question is which? Because it's just as true that that equals one as it is true that that equals one. Which one of those do I use? Don't worry about it. Let the units tell you what. We're going to multiply this by A over A. I have feet here that I want to cancel. I don't want feet, I want inches. I want to get rid of this feet. So one way to do that is to divide by feet. Then I have feet divided by feet and they cancel. The, the magic chalk of cancellation comes out to prove it. Feet cancels feet. So I know I want the one where the feet are on the bottom. And the 12 inches is on the top. I don't have to remember, do I divide, do I multiply by 12? That'll tell me. Maybe you had it in your mind anyway, but I'll, I guarantee you, half of you in here 
if well we'll do it in a second. We'll we'll change this up in a second. So what's twelve times six point seven? Huh? Eighty point four? There we go. <coughs> I don't have to remember. Do I divide by twelve or do I multiply by twelve? There's only one way it's gonna work out with the units. You have to multiply by 12 so the units will work out. You don't have to memorize anything. All right, maybe you had that one in your brain anyway. You knew that uh, you and we should multiply. But uh, if we go to the metric system, a lot of you have more trouble with that. So let's say we've got uh, something that's 801 millimeters. And I want to convert that to meters. Now, most of you know, oh, uh, well, we're going to have to divide or maybe multiply by, by, oh, I don't know, it's metric system, it's 10 or it's 100 or it's 1,000 or it's 1 tenth or 100 or 1 thousandth or something like that. I, I can't remember. Let's not worry about it. Let's let the, let's let the, uh, let's let the units tell us what to do. Can you remember what milli stands for? 1, 1, that. Now, some stuff you do just plain and simply have to memorize. You've got to get used to this stuff. Uh, a milli is 1, 1,000. So the, the, the A equals A we're looking for is that um, 1 millimeter equals 1, 1,000 of a meter. You can also do it as, uh, uh, well, if I take out the first M, I can just put in 10 to the minus third, and we got it there. I have millimeters on the top, so I want millimeters on the bottom. Now I'm just trying to figure out what the A over A is that I want to do. So there's my A over A. Millimeters cancel. I'm left with meters. Be careful that this meters doesn't go down here on the bottom. It's just one ten thousandth time that. That tells me that I take 801, divide it by a thousand, and I get meters. I don't have to remember, do I multiply by a thousand? Do I divide by a thousand? I can't remember. And you're all done. You've had trouble? Do I multiply? Do I divide with the thousands? I'll bet you have. I have. Who hasn't? If that's not the way you wanted to see this, you could have looked at it as 1,000 millimeters equals one meter, there's your A equals A. You get the same answer. It still comes out to be the same thing. What if, and this is where some students get trapped, so pay attention to this carefully. This isn't the first homework, and we're going to do it a ton of times in class. You're going to do it a lot more in your career here. What if we're not working with something simple like me like uh, like length, but we're working with something that comes from length, like volume? Say we've got uh, 62 cubic centimeters we're working with in a problem. I give myself some space because I know I'm going to have to multiply by A over A. Let's say I want to get that to inches cubed <coughs> instead. For whatever reason. You're working on a design, 
you need to design centimeters, you need to buy some stuff, but when you go to the vendor, they don't measure in centimeters, they measure in inches. So you got to order in their units because they're not as smart as you can are, you are, so you want to make the unit conversion and not trust them to do it or trust them to not do it. So we need to measure by A over A. Anybody happen to know offhand how many inches cubed in a centimeter cubed? Anybody know that offhand? No looking anything up. You know inches cubed converted to centimeters cubed? I think the, the centimeter, inches. That's not what I asked, is it? You've always had this trouble, Alan. You answer what I ask. I didn't ask, but I asked about cubed. Did anybody know inches cubed to centimeters cubed? Nah. But what is it you know, Alan? No, you're close. Because uh, what, what you do know, centimeter, some of you know centimeters in an inch. Everybody know that? 2.54 centimeters in an inch. So there's the one we can multiply by, because that's the one we know. Two point five four centimeters equals one inch. We know that. Is that what you were heading for, Alan? Just you know, if, if I think you said two point five eight, that wouldn't make very much difference. Oh, Maybe we need. I was, I was trying to. I threw you a lifeline there, Alan. You threw it back. So we know that we've got centimeters on the top. So we want centimeters on the bottom. So we'll just take a over a out of this so that the units work out. Except they don't work out. Because I've got centimeters cubed and only centimeters here. So what do I do? Cube it. We move that over so it's apparent. You've got to cube the whole thing. I don't want to just cube the centimeters, I want to cube the 2.54 as well, because that happens on each one of the edges, that 2.54 conversion happens. So now I know that it's going to, that'll take care of centimeters cubed, centimeters cubed. I don't cancel out the cubed, because I still need it here on the 2.54. So I know this is going to be 62 divided by 2.54 cubed. If you don't get that cubed in the right place, you're not going to get the right answer. You've got to be careful. This cube doesn't disappear. It doesn't cancel. We still need it down here. Uh, everybody's okay that one cubed is still one? We're okay with that one. So whatever that comes out to be, who's got that? Anybody? Alan, you got the calculator there? 3.78. I trust you. I may regret it, but I trust you. So if you're working with area or volume or any other uh, units that are squared or cubed or fourth or whatever it is we need to work with, be careful. Use it in the right way. Oh my goodness, we went way over, didn't we? Why didn't you say something? I'm sorry. I was just, I was having so much fun. We should have ended 10 minutes ago. This happens to start at every term, I do. Sorry about that. Does anybody need a hall pass? Because I made them late for the next class. My hall passes are universally accepted. No? Sorry about that. I apologize. Keep me honest. If I go over, tell me. I blame you.